In this video, what we're going to do is basically just cover the proof of one important theorem for cyclic groups. And the theorem we're going to cover is as follows. So let's suppose that G is a group and little g is an element of G. What we're going to do is look at the group generated by G, assuming that the order of G is finite, say of order n. What we want to show is that the group generated by G, although in theory that should be the set of all integer powers of the element G, what we want to show is that it's actually equal to the set of g to the 0, g to the 1st, and so on and forth, so forth, up into g to the n minus 1st power. And what's more, we'd like to show that when we're taking larger powers of g, say g to the i and g to the j, that these two things are equal if and only if n divides their difference. That is, if and only if they have the same remainder uh, when we're working modulo n, where n is special because n is the order of the group element. Now it's important before you're going to start any proof in the world, uh, you should very much understand in great detail the definitions and the theorems that are being referenced or that will be important uh, to prove your results. So in this particular theorem we mentioned the order of an element and that's an important definition to know precisely and one that abstract algebra students sometimes struggle with. So I'd say before you start working through the proof of this theorem, it's very important that you maybe pause if you don't know it off the top of your head and write down the precise definition of the order of an element. Uh, and the other theorem that we're going to be using in great detail when we work on the proof of this theorem is the quotient remainder theorem, sometimes called the division algorithm, which states that if you're working with a positive integer modulus, that every integer in the world can be written uniquely as qn plus r, where r is this remainder that has to fall in between 0 and n minus 1 inclusive. And so I would go back and for those two pieces of information, this definition of the order of an element and the statement of the quotient remainder theorem, make sure you have access to those statements and everything that they say in great detail, since that will be important as we're working through the proof of this theorem. So next let's get started on the proof. Throughout this proof, we're very frequently going to want to take an integer, different integers at different times, and we'll want to write them according to the quotient remainder theorem, um, where we're what we're dividing by is the number n. Since n is special, that's the order of our element. So let's take an arbitrary integer k and write it as qn plus r according to the quotient remainder theorem. Now remember, what will be important to us is this specification on the range of the element r. r is some number. It's greater than or equal to 0 but it's strictly less than the number n, and that's important for us. So if k is any old integer in the world, if we're looking at the power of g to the k, we can rewrite k as qn plus r, and we can use our rules of exponents to break this up as g to the n all raised to the qth power multiplied by g to the r. The benefit of doing this is that because n is the order of g, one of the things we know is that when we take g and raise it to the nth power, we're going to get the identity of our group. Now taking the identity to any old power in the world, q in particular, is still going to yield the identity. So if you make that replacement in this equation, we conclude that g raised to this arbitrary integer power is equal to g raised to the r power, where r is one of these numbers in the set, greater than or equal to 0, less than or equal to n minus 1, inclusive there. And what this shows is that the group generated by g, which a priori was just this set of all integer powers of g, in the case that g is an element of finite order, this group is actually contained in the set of powers of g, g to the 0, g to the 1st, and all the way so on and so forth, up through g to the n minus 1. Now what we'll want to show later on is that every member of this set is actually distinct from every other member of this set, the way that I have it written, in part, for example, you know, g to the first would be different from g squared and so on. Okay. That's something that we're going to come back to at the very end of the proof of the theorem. What we're going to do now is say, for the time being, we're okay with that particular containment. And what we want to do now is that if and only if part of the theorem, which states that if n divides i minus j, then g to the i is equal to g to the j, and the converse of that, if g to the i is equal to g to the j, then i minus j is divisible by n. So that's what we want to work on. The first direction of this is easy. So let's first begin by assuming that n divides i minus j. 
What this means is that when we write i minus j, a perfectly good integer according to the quotient remainder theorem, that the remainder that we get is zero. So i minus j has a remainder of zero when divided by n. Using this fact, this g to the k is equal to g to the r above that we started with, we can apply that with k equal to i minus j. In that case, the remainder r is zero, and we find that g to the i minus j is equal to g to the zero, which is the identity element. Now if you take that equation and multiply on both sides on the right by g to the j, the left hand side, g to the i minus j multiplied by g to the j simplifies to g to the i, and the identity times g to the j is g to the j, and we conclude that g to the i is equal to g to the j. Now let's go back and let's conquer the next direction. So let's first begin by assuming that g to the i is equal to g to the j, and what we want to show is that that difference, i minus j, is a multiple of n. So let's begin by going backwards from what we did previously. Let's multiply both sides of the equation on, let's say, the right by g to the minus j, and use our rules of exponents to conclude that g to the power of i minus j is equal to the identity. Now let's use the quotient remainder theorem again. Let's write i minus j as some multiple of n, qn, plus a remainder, where we know that this remainder is in this range, 0 less than or equal to r is less than n. Again, by our observation, g to the i minus j is equal to g to the r, and what we want to show is that r is equal to 0. When we put things together, here we had g to the i minus j as the identity, and here we have g to the i minus j is equal to g to the r. What we're left with is that the identity is equal to g to the r. And here's where we need to use that second part of the definition of the order of an element which says that when we have, since n is the order of the element g, that means that when we take g to the nth power, that is really and truly the first time that we get to the identity, other than the stupid choice of an exponent, which is zero as an exponent, which will always take you to the identity. So the way that I've said that here is that if we're going to have e equal to g to the r, then using the fact that n is really and truly the smallest exponent that we can take g and raise it to, to get the identity other than zero, it must either be the case that r is equal to zero, or n is a number that's less than or equal to r. That's following from the definition of the order of n. Now we're going to play that and contrast it with the information that's provided to us by the quotient remainder theorem. Recall that the quotient remainder theorem tells us that this number r is a remainder for when we divide by n, and as such, it's a number that's strictly less than n, but greater than or equal to zero. So combining these pieces of information, it can't be the case that n is less than or equal to r. r is definitely strictly less than n, and we conclude that r must be equal to zero, which shows that when we write i minus j according to the quotient remainder theorem, it's just q times n. That is, i minus j is a multiple of n. So we've done the if and only if direction of this theorem. We have shown that the group generated by g is a subset of the set of elements g to the zero, g to the first, and all the way up through g to the n minus one. What we really want to do is show that these things, g to the zero, g to the first, all the way up through g to the n minus one, that each one of these things is truly distinct. So let's suppose that they're not truly distinct. Let's pick g to the i and g to the j, where i and j are some numbers that are remainders modulo n, so they're numbers greater than or equal to zero and less than n. Let's suppose that they're equal, g to the i is equal to g to the j, and let's conclude that i in fact has to be equal to j. Now, because both i and j independently is a number in between zero and strictly less than n, when we take a look at the difference of these two numbers, we know that we're going to get something that's strictly greater than negative n, and strictly less than n. This direction is very clear. i and j are positive integers, both less than n. When I take their difference, it's certainly less than n. But because of the fact that they're both greater than or equal to zero and less than n, when I look at their difference, there's no way that I could even get down as far as negative n. So this difference, i minus j, is a number strictly bigger than n, negative n and strictly less than n. And the fact that they're equal, g to the i is equal to g to the j, we've done this part already, means that n must divide this difference, i minus j. Well, what multiple of n is it 
that i minus j is. Because it's not negative 1 times i minus j, that would give us negative n, or sorry, negative 1 times n would be too small to be i minus j, and 1 times n would be too big to be i minus j. The only multiple of n that falls in between is 0. So we conclude that i minus j is equal to 0 times n, which is equal to 0, and moving things around, we find that i is equal to j, and this is what tells us that the members of this set are each distinct.